friends shall we continue our discussions on the earth's internal forces their damages precautions etc and so far we have learnt about the earthquakes their intensity and recording them and what are the different zones of earthquake different intensity zones of earthquake in india etc we will continue yes how exactly these zones are defined that we call iso seismal line intensity of earthquake is the same all along this line all along this line all along this line this help us to decide upon and define different intensity zone iso seismal means equal intensity of the earthquake wherever we go along that line that to generate this we need to have earthquake recording stations wonderful if we have number of recording stations what is the principle of it for example i have an earthquake here the energy travels all along this its intensity is similar similarly one more here intensity is similar intensity is similar basically to reconstruct i have to have a number of recording stations based on the intensity recorded in those stations we prepare an intensity distribution map for example this is my area i have high intensity medium low intensity like that then accordingly i can take precaution in the construction etc so iso seismal line is nothing but the area or distribution of the intensity of the earthquake based on several records i have to a number of recording stations as well then number of data for a given area if i am concerned with a particular area say mysore i have to have a number of records over last several years i can refine define and uh, come up with at the same time several in bangalore i have to have mysore i have to have surrounding several places so that i can generate distribution of intensity that is iso seismal line now if i have different intensity areas then i have to construct a structure what is my message to the public how they have to construct their houses or their structure building or dam whatever it may be if their intensity zone is 1 2 3 4 what is that precaution a kind of message to the public is i have to suggest them seismic proof structure what are those example structures built on a loose soil or sediments are unsafe if you have thick loose soil cover or sediment the structure built on them is unsafe what they should do structure built on solid rock as safer so where they have to construct why solid stru structures on solid rock is safer foundation for masonry building should be excavated to same level throughout the building if i have a building mason structure here this column or this edge of the building this edge of the building this edge of the building, all should be of same depth super structure should be thoroughly tied up we have that first floor second floor third floor we have several structures super floor structures and there are different units they all should be well tied up with the foundation that is wall construction we know how while bricks they penetrate interpenetrate like that while construction of a wall we have seen those are to be thoroughly tied 
wall should be as less weight as possible in seismic prone area. We have heard in Latur earthquake collapse and damage death was mainly because of the, those low quality, poor quality construction materials, just mud and etc. Rocks and mud have not used concrete, cement, etc. Like so, continuity of a cross walls it should be maintained, and entire building behave as an integral one unit. Because during vibration, if this unit moves this way, this unit moves this way, there is a collapse, a question possibility. Or this unit moves this way, this unit moves this way, there is a collapse. Entire building should behave as one unit. Therefore, different components of the building should be well interconnected. Then damage is minimum. So, in masonry work, wall, key should be inserted in a proper style. Just now I have said while brick construction, interpenetration of brick, especially in the corner or one layer to the other layer, how they maintain, etc. RCC roof gets better resistance. Unnecessary projection should be avoided or kept minimum. Unnecessary dead load. So, structure building or building should have uniform height in one place, more height, more load, other place, less height, less load, it behaves differently. Parapets, cantilever, arches and dome, as far as possible this is to be avoided in a seismic prone area. See, we'll continue. So, structures like a cinema theatre without any cross wall is not stable in a seismic prone area. We have heard, read the building material. Building should be as light as possible in seismic prone area. So, a structure with a concrete, a cement, steel, they are more stable, safe in such area. Those precautions we have to adopt. Height of the building should be, if restricted, then it is a wonderful, very tall building. When during earthquake wall, uh, this uh, swings and center of gravity moves away from the building, collapses are more. Therefore, if a height of the building is restricted, yes, it is a safe area. Thus, these are the some general precautions we have to adopt. In general, for public, for a civil engineer, yes. Depending on the intensity of the earthquake and the zone, one, two, three, corresponding safety factor in his design he has to incorporate and come up with a good design. Yes, seismographs are recorded three types of earthquake waves. Just now we have said the P waves, S wave, L wave. These waves travel at different velocity through though they are generated simultaneously by an earthquake at the focus. Therefore, when they travel through different layers, we have different. Therefore, if I have the primary knowledge about the region, whether under, below the surface at the separate different layers or uniform rock throughout the depth, that will help us. Now, we will uh, go little more detail into the waves. This P wave, just now we said that they travel faster than S wave. The seismograph will detect P waves arriving first and S waves will come little later. The time difference as recorded on a clock between the first and the P waves come and then S wave ca come is called the lag time. P wave travel with a higher velocity they reach a recording station first, then yes wave come. The difference in this time of arriving to the recording station by P and yes wave, we call a lag time. Using the clock time numbers recorded, the lag time may be easily calculated. This is very important because we have to generate isoseismal lines, we have to record epicenter, focus, etc. Let us try a simple example. 
say an example an earthquake was recorded in san diego the seismograph record shows that p wave first arrived say 10 o'clock 2 minute 9 second so first it came then uh, pacific standard time these are all referred then s wave travels they reach that station 10 o'clock 3 minute 4 second little later what is the tag uh, lag time between this due to earthquake the answer is simple since p wave arrives first and s wave arrives later so s wave arrival time is 10 minute 10 o'clock 03 minute 4 second so then i have p wave arrival 10 o'clock 2 minute 9 second from 4 second i cannot uh, 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 yes direct 9 second therefore i take borrow so 64 second so 64 second minus 9 second so that is 55 second so then the lag time is 55 second between the s wave and the p wave just a simple calculation of lag time now we will continue <coughs> using this lag time now i try to go to locate the epicenter at focus of the earthquake how this exercise will compare and contrast two distinctly different methods for there are different methods okay, for calculating the distance to an epicenter from the earthquake to the epicenter how much distance i am located in this place where exactly is epicenter i have to locate the first method assume that earthquake wave travel at a constant speed we take this because if this is the earth section we have the crust this is a mantle and core 75% or more of the earthquakes originate from the crust and only 25% or lesser earthquakes originate from the mantle majority of the earthquakes though generated from here are not felt by us because they have to travel a long distance by the time they lose the energy therefore some of the earthquake we miss their records or do not feel at all and majority of the earthquake we feel i am talking majority of the earthquake we feel are from generated in the crust if i assume crust is made up of light silicate material say aluminum silicate i believe this is more or less of uniform composition if i consider a stenosphere then we have b layer a layer a stenosphere mode of made up of sima a layer or upper crust is made up of cl there is a compositional difference since i consider most of my earthquakes are generated between the depth of 0 to 40 km i assume that is made up of only one type of material earthquake wave travel at a constant speed therefore a for a in a given material constant speed and uses mathematical formula to determine the velocity now that is simple velocity distance we take and time for four earthquakes if we have several earthquakes we can generate the epicenter minimum 3 the calculated distance for each city means location here 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 or in a map if i have one here one here one here like that i can generate each city are then to be drawn with a drawing compass on the base map that is in figure for example if i have recorded it has traveled 200 km say 200 m as a radius i construct this point i have located the epicenter it is a, say 150 m depth if this may be 100 m depth 
means 100 me 100 me sorry 100 kilometer 100 kilometer as a radius 150 kilometer as a radius 200 kilometer as a radius i draw a circle all they meet intersect here that is the point where earthquake waves are generated now i am trying to consider this we try in a simple method for example velocity of wave say say consider p wave it travels with a velocity of 4 miles per second miles or kilometer whatever the unit we can say and then we have say s wave travels with okay so velocity is a distance divided by time let the distance traveled by that wave is a 100 mile then time of p wave 100 mile is the distance 4 is the time taken miles per second this is a speed therefore it takes 25 seconds to reach the particular recording station what i mean to say 100 meter suppose the distance it has traveled as we have recorded from the seismograph then we have discussed already it has traveled 100 meter and it has taken this is the speed of the wave Therefore, this is the time taken by that wave to reach a particular recording station. <coughs> yes, wave that also has to travel the same distance 100 kilometer, 100 miles or kilometer, and then its speed is so much, then it has taken 40 seconds to reach that recording station. A wave takes 25 seconds, P wave, sorry, P wave takes, takes 40, uh, 25 seconds. Yes, so it takes 40 seconds. The lag time is 40 minus 25, that is 15 seconds. Okay, we will continue. Now, we will continue. 100 mile or kilometer is the distance to be traveled. The time lag is 15 second, 40 second, 25 second. Difference between P and S wave, the lag is 15 second. Since the question is how far, I have to use the distance formula. The distance equal to velocity to time. In this case, velocity is the lag, time velocity. So, 100 kilometer divided by lag time into 30 seconds. Therefore, that is a difference between and we have the 200 miles. So, if a lag time is 15 second correspond to 100 miles of distance to the epicenter, how far is the epicenter from another recording station if the time lag is 30 second? So, so this is, since the question is how far, we have to use a distance formula again, velocity into time, oh, same repetition, sorry. Ah, so, if we have at least three earthquake recording stations, just now I said one recording station, some depth I get, second recording station, some depth I get, some other station, some recording station, this is the point. So at least if I have three earthquake recording stations are required to locate the earthquake epicenter. A single recording station can only calculate the distance from how much it has traveled, but not the direction. So, and epicenter to cover all possibilities as many recording stations are good. Then the distance as a radius if we construct in a graph we can find out. Friends, so far we have discussed how to locate the epicenter intensity of the earthquake, how we can. Now our question is, we construct dams and reservoirs. What will happen if the earthquake occurs below the reservoir? And that is one, reservoir also induces the earthquake. How? Example. If this is the reservoir, 
water can percolate into the ground. There are different layers of rocks, there may be some fractures in the rock. Water that percolated through the rock may reach the fracture and they may lubricate the contact between the rocks. And when it is a loaded reservoir, pressure built up and the percolated water reaches this fracture zone, lubricate the contact, this contact can easily slide. Once two rock blocks like this, they are fractured and they slide. This may move up or this may move up, they may slide. There is a little collapse or collapse and then we have earthquakes generated. This kind of earthquakes generated below the reservoir due to the water stored in the reservoir. There is a pressure and seepage or uh, percolation of water is called reservoir induced seismicity. Friends, it is not restricted to just the seismicity alone. Suppose I have a deep fracture, deep enough, water percolating through this deep fracture can reach the great depth. What happens in a great depth? There is a high temperature. And because of that high temperature, the water gets steamed. The steam has ability to exert pressure. Therefore, once it exerts a pressure, these cracks are widened. When the cracks are widened, volume increased, pressure lowered, melting point also comes down. For a given temperature, if melting point is lowered, it can melt. Therefore, once it melts, we have lava. And there is already a fracture. Through this fracture, lava can come. One, a large quantity of magma are removed, sudden release of energy, again that causes an earthquake. So, reservoir induced seismicity is directly due to percolation of water and deep percolation of water can lead to volcano. Volcano also can cause earthquakes which is common in Japan. And therefore, work, volcano and earthquakes go hand in hand in Japan. And that kind of seismicity is possible especially under water. It can go little longer time than it happens on the land. Because there is a complementary other force, water is adding. Reservoir filling increases the vertical stress over the underlying rock. Further increasing the pore water pressure there. The increased pore pressure reduces the net effective stress. Just now I said the lubricating the contact reduces the shear, facilitates the movement. So, along the fracture or the fault, normal effective stress equal to normal stress minus pore water pressure, therefore effective stress become less and therefore they become weak. Shear fracturing occurs along the differential movement takes place along this fault plane leading to earthquake. This we call reservoir, uh, reservoir induced seismicity. Yes. What are the factors that control, determine the reservoir induces seismicity? Presence of fault in the vicinity of the reservoir, not necessarily directly under the reservoir if there is a fault. If there is a fault here, water percolated here or water percolated may flow and reach the fault plane or weak plane. Presence of fault plane even in the vicinity of the reservoir is also causes subsurface geology. If weak rocks or fractures, porous rocks, all these contribute to. So, subsurface geology that is below the reservoir, what are the rock types? It means I have to investigate not just the site where I am going to construct the dam, 
the reservoir where it is spread uh, underlying rocks also even nearby if there is a fault. Type of fault, strike, slip, fault or normal fault. Normal fault we have said vertical. If this is one, this is one, this is the normal fault. What is the normal fault? If this is one block, what is another block? A block moving down due to gravity is a normal. So, this is a normal fault that is the exact definition we define a little later. Normal fault at this stage means two blocks slide against each other such that the block one which moves down. We have a fault plane here. This block moved downward relative to it, this. This is a normal fault. This one we call foot wall. This we call hanging wall because unsupported. Unsupported wall moves downward. Types of fault is very important. Just then I have shown as a, this is a transverse fault, a strike fault, a strike slip. Movement is along the lateral, whereas it is a vertical. Chances of water percolating deep here is more. Okay. We have Koina earthquake, we have the records that is nothing but the reservoir induced. Prior to the construction of Koina Dam, on an average, 350 shocks were recorded in an instrument, Koina Dam. After construction of the Koina Dam, on an average, 1500 shocks are being recorded. What is the meaning? It is due to the construction of the reservoir, percolation of water, the frequency of earthquake have increased. In a way, is some way something is better because it did not happen all energy accumulated and one day it released major disturbance in pulses and pulses several earthquake energies released to that extent it is good but the frequency is alarming 1500 then 350 five times more we are worried one day therefore Beyond the capacity or a critical limit of the reservoir, storing water in Koina is a dangerous. Therefore, they release the water. So, so no. Precautions to be taken to avoid a reservoir induced. There we have taken some precaution about the construction of the building, etc. Now, the reservoir is also another avoiding design of a large reservoir for area where faults are present or seismic prone area etc. Example, during heavy rain, we read in newspaper that Tungvadra dam so much is filled, so much filled, so much filled. We are worried about only Tungvadra, not other dam. Doing any earthquake, we read in newspaper, Koina Dam is safe, Hidical Dam is safe. Why? As if there are only two dams, there are hundreds of dams. It means those dams are constructed where underlying rocks are weak. We are worried about the safety. Therefore, it is an alarming news to the message, public that this dam is safe. Those are free from earthquake, but their problem is different, sedimentation. Thus, we have so different type if we have constructed a reservoir or a dam where lot of uh, faults, fractures, underlying geological conditions are weak. Yes, we have to take precaution, we should not construct. If at all we have constructed, lot of precautions are required that we will discuss under a separate dam, etc. But in general for message to the public. Suitable treatment of subsurface geological features such as faults. What kind of precautions we can take? Example, I go to the super dam. We have this is a super dam. Okay, this is the reservoir like this is the land. Now Below that, there are several fractures and 
we must have heard of Nagzeri powerhouse or Sykes Point, etc., from where water is taken through the tunnel to the Nagzeri powerhouse, etc. There are faults. This, along this fault, there is a possibility of a seepage of water. I share a small incident. At the time of construction of the Supa Dam, the KPC engineers were sealing these fractures through grouting and trucks of cement slurries injected into the ground. The engineers wrote in their report beautifully like this. So much of uh, tons of cement slurry is injected. They must have calculated the volumes uh, of uh, the fractures and they felt very happy. But the very next day, one villager came and reported to the KPC that, see, cement is flowing, all your cement is flowing in the river. What happened? Because there were so deep fractures, connected fractures, they have injected slurry, it did not fill the cavities or fracture directly flowed into the river. This has happened. Therefore, under this condition, what is? We have to carefully grout and therefore, from there everywhere, they have not at one point, at several point, rock bolting, rock jointing, simultaneously grouting. So, suitable treatment means not only the grouting, there are other methods are also required. So, depending on the nature of the fracture zone, we have to take precaution. Then, carefully examining area where reservoir area is surrounded by pre pervious rocks and there may be porous and permeable rock through which water can percolate. It is a reservoir. Water may percolate here. Percolated water may go here or may go here. They may cause problem there. Therefore, even the surrounding area, if we have a pervious rocks, we have to check them and properly judge the suitability of the project accordingly. We have to carefully take up and therefore, Although construction of a dam is a la small area, our effect of this dam and the reservoir is very large. Therefore, large area is to be thoroughly checked and mapped, studied. Friends, uh, we have discussed reservoir induced seismicity. While mentioning the reservoir induced seismicity, I have also mentioned volcano. During earthquake also we have during the plate boundary, plate moving apart, plate moving together, we have mentioned possibility of volcano also. So what exactly is volcano? And how this is connected to earthquake, earthquake is connected to volcano, we will try to understand. So, what is volcano? What are the types and causes? Friends, there are several methods of classification of the volcano depending on their possible damage. One way of classifying volcano is based on this central fissure type that is mode of eruption. And second is based on the record of activities. So, this is very important. First of all, let us know what is volcano. Volcano is nothing but sudden removal of a hot liquid from depth to the surface. At the depth, we call them magma. When it reaches to the surface, we call a lava. When it comes to the surface, then only we come to know. If it is solidified inside a depth, we do not know when it happened, when it happens, solidified does not affect the surface. If sudden quantity, large quantity of lava, magma is brought to the surface, it creates a problem, damage and this is called volcano. Volcano means 
large quantity of hot liquid comes to the surface when it comes to the surface we call it a lava when it is at a great depth we call magma simple the same liquid but its physical chemical compositions are different when it is at a great depth the water vapor or gases that were present in a magma or that hot liquid did not escape they induce some kind of viscosity or fluidity its viscosity is low at depth so that kind of property they induce to the liquid when volcano earthquake or volcano takes place this liquid comes to the surface and on reaching the surface gases and water vapor escape into the air obviously the liquid now has lesser proportion of these gases and water obviously its viscosity increases because of this viscosity there is a change in physical chemical composition behavior of the liquid varies therefore i use the term lava when it is on the ground i use magma when it is in the depth it means their physical and chemical properties are different so large quantity of hot liquid along with the water vapor and gases coming to the surface slowly or suddenly is called volcano so when suddenly a large quantity of mass is removed there is a kind of vibration lead to earthquake this is also called volcanic induced earthquake now if all the magma comes only through single fracture and suddenly pressure is removed it is associated with a large disturbances that is the central eruption if it everything comes and they become viscous and they build they do not flow for a long distance they build a mountain like a hill like a structure that is the central volcano on the other hand fissure type is on reaching certain depth they come in a different path and therefore pressure is released through several fractures and therefore damage is less and once it reach it flows it builds here 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 therefore a kind of plateau ridge uh, sorry plateau like surface is built by this kind of volcano this is fissure several fractures fissures that is this type of classification is important i can guess understand what is the possible damage a single uh, central associated with earthquakes are more common earthquake may occur of milder intensity this is one we also classify them based on the record of activities example active that means frequently it occurs say in japan we say every 30 40 years there is a volcanic activity means in the same place this is active volcano in the same place every 30 40 years volcanic activity is taking place active volcano there are other type of dormant means rarely occurs it happened once but over several million years it has not happened example example madagascar india and africa we had this separation once happened volcanic massive volcano between this one separate massive volcanism happened once in st mary's island if i date then we have deccan volcanics this is 60 55 to 65 million years this is somewhere around 80 million years this is somewhere around 180 120 million years like volcanic activity happened but it is not very frequently dormant some 120 130 million years 
till St. Man is silent. Nearly 40 million years there was silent. There is no activity at all. We believe it is a dead. But from 80 million years, there is 65 million. There were once again, there was massive volcanism. Remember periodicity, 120 million years back, you know, 80 million years back, this is 64 million years back. And then we have somewhere around 50 million years. See, the frequency is low, very less, but periodicity gradually changing. But we do not know when next volcano. It is a kind of a dormant, almost a dead, but we cannot say it is 100% died. It may happen. When it happens, we are not sure. So, whereas active, at least in 30, 40 years, it recurrently occurs. Dead or no further activity, no further record. What it means, there was a kind of volcanic activity, but so far nothing has happened. Simple example, I give a Medur, near Shumagga, Bailongal, near Dharwad. There was volcanic activity somewhere around 2500 million years back. But since then, there was no record of volcanic activity. So, what is the significance of this? One way is there is no related damage. The related do not come, lava do not come or do not earthquakes due to volcanic eruption, no further record. This is one message. Second message is, morning I have quoted one example of I have to bury uranium ash in a lead container. Where I shall bury? Shall I bury in this area? Active volcano every 30 40 years, if there is a volcanic activity, I have a my uranium ash buried here, and there is a volcanic activity surrounding that lava comes and they may melt this container and releases active radioactive material contamination. Possible. This is not a safe place to bury that uranium ash, radioactive ashes or waste. This is not the proper way. If I have here, okay, that is somewhat better, but 120 million years, 80 million years, 60 million, 55 million years, I don't know when it may happen. When I bury uranium ash, I should be guaranteed that for coming 1 million year, 1 lakh year, it should not happen anything. It is not for 100 years I plan. I construct a house or a dam or something, I have planned 100 years or 200 years or 50 years, whatever it may be. But uranium ash, if I have to bury, it is not 100 years, not 1000 years, 1000 years, yes. We have built Taj Mahal, we have Shavan Bhargava, they have to be stunned, coming several thousand years. Yes. But uranium ash, not several hundred, several thousand, it is millions of years. Therefore. I cannot select my place here, I cannot place here, but I can, dead. Last 2500 million, nothing has happened, this landmass is very stable. Therefore, I can select this area to bury uranium ashes in a lead container. So, this is a message, this is very important for me. Yes, a beautiful picture, yes, this we all we know. St. Mary's Island. See, this eruption of lava can take place in any place, in any mode, but three different modes we have just mentioned. Now you see, St. Mary's Island. In a shallow sea, if a lava erupts, what will happen? And they develop a beautiful pillow structure or this. If it is on the land, St. Mary's Island, then it was a land. Now it is occupied by sea. But when it was erupted, it was a land. They built a beautiful columnar structure. This flows, this is lava flowing on the ground. This is near hospital. You see, this is a black material, a ridge like. <coughs> it's a kind of dike. Lava comes to the surface and flow 
it is a wall like in a plane they come and this is the dark material and they are harder resistant than the adjacent rocks they resist and this water remained as a hill here lava came to the surface in a fracture like again a wall like appears its relation to the surrounding rock is a wall like it reached the surface in a fracture like this was the fracture like through a fracture it came so in a different mode they get erupted they form a different land forms they have implications on civil engineering activities tourism center they resist weathering on either side and remain as a hill this dike may act as a barrier for flow of ground water if i put a well in one side of the dike i may get good quantity of water the other side i may not get good quantity of water because water do not flow across they may act as a barrier and this kind of volcano may lead to we have in a uh, bombay such area maharashtra deccan volcanoes where we get good quantity of zeolite etc that itself is zeolite is uh, an uh, important material in all our uh, drinking water for purification synthetic zeolite we use this is a natural zeolite such these are the sources of zeolites they not only serve as the resources they build different uh, landforms and associated with them there is a damages like earthquake etc so that's important for us friends we have studied earthquake volcano how earthquake and volcanoes are related now one more is related to earthquake is a tsunami what is tsunami tsunami is nothing but if earthquake take place below the water say sea or a lake or our reservoir etc if earthquake take place what may happen so if we have a jug of water and suddenly pull a material just pull and or drop some some waves are generated correct so on a quiet water some disturbances cause waves these waves see travel towards the land what may happen earthquakes volcanic eruption and other underwater explosions create subsidence of the land release of sudden energy even glacier sudden ice blocks chunk and fall meteoric impact something sudden fall on the fall into sea and other disturbances above or below the water level they have ability to handle tsunami this are anything can what is tsunami a disturbance below the water which generates the waves these waves can create main major problem example i have at a depth say i have some kind of disturbance here some waves are generated these wave travel towards the surface towards the land as the depth of the water this is the land the depth to the ground depth to the ground depth to the ground as the depth towards the ground depth of the ground decreases decreases the waves grow in side grow in their height because this we call wave length if wave height so <coughs> the conservation of energy so if 
the wave length decreases, wave height increases, wave height increases, length decreases, length decreases. So, height increases, height increases, conservation of energy. Now, when the waves travel towards the land, the depth decreases because of the sea bottom nature, the depth decreases, friction with the ground increases, these waves grow in size, at the same time they undergo friction with the ground, they change in their direction and also travel with higher and higher velocity and therefore high waves hits the land. This is a tsunami. For one or major cause of tsunami is underwater earthquake or volcano. How this tsunami is going to damage, how it grows, we will discuss later.